really want to you know, just throw out some love. Okay? <clears throat> so thank you to you guys. Um, thank you to Facebook Live. We have this Facebook Live right now on Project Move site. Um, thank you for watching live or watching in the future, if you're watching this, or if you guys watch it um, in the future. But tonight, um, <clears throat> I'm going to take you on a journey. And the journey might be comfortable and uncomfortable at times. Right? And, and you'll see why here. Um, some of you, I'm sure you've, you've talked to nutritionists, you've talked to dietitians, you've read magazines and articles and websites, and there's so much out there right now. It's, it's actually hard to navigate, um, even for myself. It's very hard to stay on top of a lot of the stuff that's floating around. So today I, pick, I picked a, a topic that I want to focus on, but I'd be willing to answer questions um, off on tangents as long as I can kind of pull us back. So very informal. If you guys have questions let, or comments, just ask as we go along. I'm going to be talking about metabolic efficiency training. Um, so a little bit about me first, and I'll tell you about the topic. I wear a couple different hats as a professional. So you can obviously read uh, for yourself up there. But tonight, I'm talking to you as a sport dietitian. I am a registered dietitian. I'm one of very few um, male registered dietitians are very few in the whole registered dietitian career field. We're about 2 to 3% of the entire field. So mostly female dominated. Um, I do come from an exercise physiology strength and conditioning background. So I did my education a little backwards than most dietitians do. So I have exercise science, exercise phys, strength and conditioning. Then I went back to school for nutrition. So I kind of combined both of my loves um, for athletics, for sport, for fitness, and nutrition. So you'll see that a little bit today. What I want to talk to you today about, though, is completely about metabolic efficiency. So I, I know some of you in the room, but how many of you have heard just that term, metabolic efficiency? Yeah, so you've heard the term. Okay, this is good. So I don't know what you've heard about it. So I will dispel some of the myths, and I will give you a whole bunch of information. I will give you at least probably three golden nuggets. Golden nuggets are what I say you're going to leave here remembering, of which one you'll probably put into practice, right? But, but all of you are coming for, from different guidelines or from different uh, populations, different interests. So I, I'm not quite sure what you're going to gain out of this. I know what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm probably going to blow your so uh, knock your socks off, blow your socks off, because it's what I present and when I present it is pretty different. Um, it's not your traditional dietitian presentation, right? I'm not going to talk to you about calorie counting. I'm not going to talk to you about meal plans. I'm not going to talk to you about weighing food, right? I am the exact anti and the opposite of most dietitians out there, right? I did work in a clinical setting during my internship, but that's it, right? When I went into sport nutrition and actually studied, or studied dietetics, I knew the only thing I wanted to do was to work with active individuals and not in a hospital. So the only time I actually spent in clinical was during my internship, when you kind of have to spend time in clinical. So should we get started? You guys ready for this? Really, you ready? Because this is this might be uncomfortable for some of you, right? Especially if you like in the past, you're like, no, I I was a calorie counter, and I used to do that as a dietitian. I used to give calorie counts and meal plans, and they look great, right? Until you go into the grocery store, and you've got this piece of paper, and you're like, I don't know what to buy, or then you get home, and you're like, I don't know how to cook this stuff. So I'm going to take it back to the basics, very simplistic. I believe in simple is sustainable, right? I'm going to take a lot of the science, like Steve was saying, and I'm going to give it into more of a consumer-based approach, right? Because I think, I think that's what we all want, right? So here's a technical definition of metabolic efficiency training. It's basically saying we have these stores of fat and carbohydrate in our body. How can we be more efficient at using them, right? So whatever your goals are, it could, be, it could be performance, it could be weight loss, it could be improving health, blood lipid markers, you name it, right? You're going to want to somehow, sometime, tap more into your fat stores. And I'll tell you why. Everybody sitting in this room has about, roughly, without doing muscle biopsies, we, we don't know, um, probably 80,000 or more calories stored as fat in your body. Sometimes you can't see it. It's intra-abdominal, it's intra-organ, you can't see your fat, right? It's subcutaneous. 80,000. Do you guys know how many marathons you can run one after then another with 80,000 calories as fat? A lot, a lot, right? But how many, how, many, how many calories do we have as carbohydrates stored in our body? Depends on your size and your gender. So males, big guys, will have about 2,000 calories worth of, of carbohydrates stored in their body, their muscles and their liver, a little bit in their blood. Small petite females, around 1,200 to 1,400. Why is that important? Who cares? Because there's an imbalance there, right? So in our society, and I grew up, and I was even taught in education, you know, the high-carb, low-fat diet or way of eating, that's the thing. And that's the thing because we don't have a lot of stores of carbohydrates, so the thought process was if we don't have a lot of stores and we're using carbohydrate as energy, 
then we better eat a lot of carbs. But then what happened in our society? Disease states started popping up, right? Obesity rates went up, diabetes went up. So, so this whole change has been happening in the last 10 years in nutrition. So metabolic efficiency, it's not a diet, right? It's a lifestyle pattern that you can follow based on where you are in your health goals and your exercise goals, right? But it's looking at the storage of fat and carbohydrate and making you more efficient at using either one or both. So I can, I can actually give you a nutrition program so you can be a sugar burner if that's what you want. I wouldn't recommend it, right? Because usually that, that relates into higher body weight, higher body fat, sometimes some disease states, prediabetes, right? So we're kind of in this game to teach ourselves how to, how to tap into those 80,000 or more calories as fat. So if you use more fat as energy, what do you preserve? Carbohydrates. So if you're athletic, if you exercise, you need carbs at a certain intensity, and I'll show you this soon. At a certain intensity, your body needs carbohydrates. But if you're running low, has anyone ever hit that wall? That's you running low on stored carbohydrates. But if you teach your body to, to burn more fat and preserve more carbohydrate, you have carbohydrates when you need them, but you don't need to overconsume them. Hmm. So why metabolic efficiency? So there's five main reasons, right? If, if, so this works wonderfully in, in people who do endurance events, usually a little bit longer, half marathon, marathon, Ironman distance, so those distances, right? Because those guys and gals usually get GI distress, nausea, vomiting, bloating, diarrhea during their events. So this actually either decreases or eliminates GI distress. And most of the time, I'm not gonna get into that because that's not the bulk of this presentation. Most of the time, that's because they're eating too much sugar right, especially during the, the, the race or during the training session. But we're going to cover some of these other things. Number two, and improves your fat oxidation. That's burning. Oxidation is burning, right? And carbohydrate preservation. And that's just what I said. If you incorporate your body's ability to burn fat, you'll preserve carbohydrate. But the opposite is also true, right? If you teach your body to burn carbohydrate, guess what you preserve? I mean, it's really, it's simple biochemistry in your body, and I'll actually take a snapshot of that a little bit later, right? Change body weight and body composition. I would argue that all of us, at some point in our lives, as we get older, want to change the way we look from a body comp or, and or a body weight standpoint. It could be anything from health, performance, aesthetics, you name it, right? But this, this affects it, and it's not a diet. That's the great thing, right? I'm not going to teach you how to diet, because that's ridiculous, right? Changes uh, or improves health markers. So how many of you have had blood work done at your physician's office? Like full panel, full blood lipid panel that measures the phenotype and measures particle size of HDL and LDL. Okay, some of you have, which is fantastic. Not a lot of physicians are doing that these days. So off on a tangent, when you go to your physician next time, please ask them to do that, right? If you have great insurance, it'll cover it that is so necessary to look at actually what's going on inside your body from a blood lipid standpoint. Uh, it's just called the particle size. If you just say the particle size, they'll know, they should know what it is, right? The reason that's important, again, off on a tangent really quick, but since we're here, the reason that's important because we don't really care about total cholesterol. We really don't. We'll look at it and we'll say, all right, but what's your, what's your HDL? What's your LDL? But even below that, we look at the size of your LDL in your HDL. So they're a little bit more complex tests, but it's easy because you're already giving blood. All they have to do is order that particular test. Okay. But this way of eating can actually improve those blood lipid markers. It can improve sleep and can improve recovery. Right. Last one, developing a healthy relationship with food. I told you first, I'm not going to teach you how to calorie count or meal plan or any of that. Right. The whole basis of this is controlling blood sugar through food and developing an instinctual relationship with food, meaning you know when you're hungry and you know when to eat. You may make wrong choices every so often, and we all do, we all do, right? But the, the fact is sometimes we don't acknowledge when we're hungry and when we're not hungry, or maybe we're emotionally hungry and not biologically hungry. So do you guys know three types of hunger? Biological hunger is when we should eat. That is when you are sitting here and your stomach is it's talking to you, right? That is biologically your time to put food in your body. So but there's two other times of eating that sometimes we don't acknowledge. One is habitual eating. So it's 6 o'clock p.m., it's dinner time, I'm sitting down, I might not be hungry, but I'm going to eat. So the question is, why do you do that? Because it's a habit. It's hard to break a habit. Right? So the third one is, is, is the, the beautiful one. The beautiful one meaning it's the toughest to break. It's emotional eating. So all of us get stressed, right? 
Stress is good and bad. We can be happy, we can be fatigued, we can be sad, we can be just whatever. And we can be driven to food. I'm driven to food. You know what food I'm driven to when that happens? And someone will also share this also. Chocolate. I'm a chocoholic. Who's a chocoholic? Dark chocolate all the time, right? But, but so you have to think about like, why am I eating this chocolate? Is it because I'm hungry? Or is it because emotionally I'm connected to this chocolate because it's gonna make me feel good because I'm stressed? So this whole eating, this whole controlling your blood sugar through food will actually help create a better relationship with food. And as a dietitian, that's what I want to help you do. We all need to navigate that somehow, right? All right, so let me give you a little bit of history. We're starting in a little bit more science, but I'm gonna break it down. The history is this wonderful graph, right? This graph is, is age old. I don't even know, probably in the 50s or 60s, maybe even older than that. This is called the crossover concept. So in exercise physiology, this is the, the relationship between fat burning, and that's the percentage. So 90% fat burning, 85% fat burning. This blue line is carbohydrate burning or oxidation, right? All this graph is saying is, as you're sitting here, I really hope most of you are burning a lot of what? Fat. I really hope you are. And, and you should be, unless your nutrition plan is completely array. But as you increase the intensity of exercise, and this is the key, higher intensity exercise, your body needs more carbohydrate. But we don't know where, and we don't know when. Somewhere around here, which we really don't know, except for research 30 to 50 years ago said, this crossover point where your body says, okay, I can't rely a lot on fat anymore because the intensity is getting too high, so I have to dip into my carbohydrate stores. So then fat, carbo or fat burning goes down and carbohydrate burning goes up. That's fine, that's the way our body is, is, work is working, right? So they found, these researchers found this crossover point happens between 63 to 65% of your max intensity. So that could be defined as max heart rate or max VO2. But guess what? There's only one intervention that they did, only exercise. So I had this idea in my head. This has been 14 years now since I developed the metabolic efficiency concept, and it was all by asking a question, why didn't they do nutrition? Why didn't they put in a food something intervention here? Why did they only choose exercise? So this is what you see if, if you guys ever use cardio machines, right? Stair climbers, ellipticals, treadmills. I actually don't even know if they still make these, they put them on there, but sometimes there was that little colorful chart. You guys remember that? It's the fat burning zone. And you're on there and you're like, wow, I need to stay at this speed or this heart rate because that's my fat burning zone. You have no idea if that's your fat burning zone. All they're saying is that if you stay under, so let's say 65% of your max intensity, you're gonna burn more what? Fat. But you don't know where 65% is. You don't even know if 65% is you. And I'm gonna validate that for you in a few slides, right? So old research gave us this incredible concept, which is fantastic. So I started scratching my head and saying, why, 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 why? Came up with a nutrition intervention. So I actually studied quite a few people way back in the days and tested them. And I did an exercise only intervention versus a nutrition only. So I kind of separated those. And I found that nutrition, daily nutrition, food intake, actually had a more robust effect on the way people burn fat and carbohydrate than exercise did. So here's what's really exciting. You can say this. In my personal testing, so I do this testing, and I'll show you some great case studies at the end so just to really, really knock your socks off. <clears throat> but I have tested people who have had this little point, what it, which I call the metabolic efficiency point. It's where your body uses more, more fat versus carbohydrate or vice versa. I've seen one person at an 87% of their max VO2. But remember what I just showed you? The old research says only 63 to 65. So wait, am I wrong? Is my metabolic cart wrong? No, it's not because this is actually brand new research from this year, right? Medicine, science, sports, exercise from literally a couple months ago. They just did a study and they found this ranges, this point ranges anywhere between 23% of max intensity to 89%. So all of you in here you don't know when you start burning more or less fat when you're working out. When you're sitting here, hopefully you're burning more fat, right? Hopefully, unless there's a disease state going on. But when you're working out, what if you're working out too hard and you're really burning a lot of your carbohydrate stores? And if that's your goal, that's your goal, right? But if you're trying to burn fat, you better know where this point is so you can stay to the left of it. 
or maybe, maybe cycle in and out of these zones or the heart rate or the pace or the intensity, right? Huh. So nutrition is actually three quarters of this equation. Exercise is only a quarter. So you can beat yourself up in, in, in the weight room, in the gym, outside, and just exercise and exercise and exercise. And even you can stay in this fat burning zone, but you still may not attain your goals because you haven't addressed what you need to do nutritionally. 75% of the equation here, right? So unfortunately, some, I've tested a lot of people who actually look like this. Remember the blue line is carbohydrate, red line is fat. There is no cross or metabolic efficiency point. These people are so inefficient at using fat as energy, they're always burning more carbs. So you can argue, well, is that bad? Well, I don't know. You choose. It kind of depends on who you are and what you do, right? So if you are looking at this where you're using more carbohydrates as energy almost all the time instead of fat, pick out what's important to you, right? At the end, this, kind of, this, this is where it kind of the, the rubber meets the road for me, right? The more sugar that's in your diet, that promotes more sugar burning. That promotes actually more of a disease state or an increased risk of disease states because a lot of diseases these days, and I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but there's a lot of debunking of the whole cardiovascular disease and what develops plaque in the arteries. It's not saturated fat. You know what it is? It's inflammation. Inflammation can be caused by your nutrition. Hmm, interesting. Or working out too hard, too long, too many times. Right? So there is a balance there for sure. Right? So looking at this, so all this inefficiency can lead to, again, you name what's important to you, but we know there are health markers, there are performance markers that you can be uh, predisposed to when you are not efficient at using fat and using carbohydrate well. So here's, here's my little graph, okay? Metabolic efficiency is the red, right? So 75% of this is what you put in your, your mouth. It's food. No pills, no powders, no potions. We can talk about those, but I'm talking about food, right? I'm talking about what you get at the grocery store on the outer aisles, right? Not in the inner aisles necessarily. So 75% of it is here, 25% is exercise. So we can't discount exercise, but it's not a major component of the, of the equation. So this is what I love. Let me explain what this nutrition periodization is. That is the foundation of everything you should do nutritionally. So you should ask yourself, what, how am I working out? Why am I working out? What are my goals? What are my objectives? Am I doing strength? Am I doing endurance? Am I doing a blend of that? And you ask yourself, where am I in my training? Am I training hard? Am I training easy? Am I walking? Am I running? Right? This nutrition periodization means your nutrition, your food plan should change as your exercise changes. So maybe you get injured. God forbid you get injured, right? and you're not exercising, what should happen to your food intake? It should change to support an injury state. What happens if you're, you're training and you're like at the peak of your training, you're training a lot, four times a week, five times, six times a week. Well, your nutrition should follow that. That's the whole nutrition periodization. That always supports what type of training you do. Now there's these little outliers. I drew this bell-shaped curve for a reason, right? Because we've got these wonderful outliers on both sides. We've got on the right our HCLF, high carb, low fat diets. Right? It used to be the way of eating, but now it's a diet. I can pretty much stand up here and say that is not good anymore. Right? Now at certain times, certain athletes will have a little bit more carbohydrate, and that's fine, depending on their goals, their objectives, and where they are in their exercise or their training season. But for the most, most part, for most of us, somewhere in here is the most important. But, but I think we need to really talk about the left side, don't we? Because this is a buzz right now. LCHF, what does that stand for? Low carb, high fat. So let's just say this is not ketogenic. I'm not going to talk about ketogenic right now. I'm going to talk about low carb, high fat, right? So low carb, high fat could be anything. Did you know that there is not a research article or a scientific study that's been done to actually qualify what low carb, high fat means quantitatively? So if you eat 500 grams of carbohydrate a day and then tomorrow you eat 400, you're on a low carb diet because you ate lower carbs, right? I can't stand it, I, I really can't stand it, right? So there are people who are going into ketogenic diets. Now we're talking about a certain definition of carbohydrate intake. It's usually 20 to 40 grams or less. However, here's the thing. If, if you do it, so be it. But you don't know if you are actually in ketosis unless you monitor via blood. 
blood ketones, right? Breath doesn't work as well. The blood is measuring much better information. So if you're getting really specific about it, you need to measure blood because you could be eating 40 grams, and I've seen this before in people, and I've worked with them, 40 grams of carbohydrate a day, and you're still not in ketosis because your body's different than mine. Maybe you need more or less carbs. I will tell you this. Has anyone played with ketogenic diets? They're, they're tough to follow long-term, right? Short-term, quick, easy. You'll drop weight. You'll drop muscle glycogen. You might drop some muscle. Never know, depending on what you're doing for exercise. They're very tough uh, long-term, right? But short-term, they actually produce great effects in terms of weight loss. However, what do you sacrifice sometimes? Energy, right? So now you have to look at what do I want to do during my day? Do I need to be cognitively focused at work with my family? What am I doing for exercise? If I'm lifting heavy, I don't know. That might not be the best. But if I'm going for a long walk or a run or a bike ride that's low intensity, maybe that's okay. So in the whole scope of things, you have to ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? The nutrition, this nutrition periodization, that should support whatever your goals are. But I will tell you this, these outliers are probably not worth discussing because metabolic efficiency, while it's not a diet, it gives you a lot of leeway. And that's why I drew this as a bell-shaped curve, right? So I have people, and just to throw out, and I don't promote this, but a lot of the people I work with sometimes, they're, you know, they're using my fitness pal, and they're already using this stuff. So I take a sneak peek at it just because I want to see what they're doing. And some people eat, you know, they may eat 100 grams of carbohydrate a day. Some may eat 300 grams of carbohydrate a day. But guess what? They're still balancing their blood sugar. I'm going to teach you how to do this, right? It, so that's, that's the drum roll as we're getting there. But it, there's not necessarily a diet plan. There's not a, range, there's not a specific amount of carbs, protein, and fat. Now, I can come close to individualizing, but in a presentation, because we're all different, we don't know what those amounts are. Right? Because we're all so different. So if you come to see me for a nutrition consultation, I'll ask you, have you had blood work done? Have you had a metabolic efficiency test done? I want all those quantitative things first to see what we're working with. We call it popping the hood. Let's see what you got. Right? And if not, we're guessing right? without test. It's like if you came to me and said, I want to decrease my cholesterol. And I say, great. What's your cholesterol? I don't know. And I'm not going to get it measured, but I want you to help me decrease it. So I, I, I mean, I'm knowledgeable. I can probably create a nutrition plan that will decrease your cholesterol. Maybe, maybe not, because everyone's so different, right? So maybe you need more fat in your diet, in your daily nutrition plan, to decrease cholesterol. Maybe you don't. Certain people are built different ways, right? That's the different genomics of, of how we're, we're built, right? Okay, does this make sense? Yeah. I like pictures, if you can tell, right? You really like this one. So the nutrition roller coaster. So this is, so I created metabolic efficiency. I'm not this diet guru. I'm, I build everything on science, right? So I looked at biochemistry, metabolism, nutrition science, exercise physiology back in the days. And I'm like, I wonder if there's something here that I just never looked at or paid attention to in school, right, in those classes. And there, there kind of was, right? Basic biochemistry says, and there's nothing against pasta, right? I just want to signify this photo as carbohydrate, right? If you eat carbohydrate, your body in a non-disease state is processed to burn carbohydrate. That's what we do. Is it the same for fat? Not quite, unless you teach it to burn fat. But we're really good at eating an apple, and we're going to burn carbohydrate. But if you eat butter, not that you do that by itself, but it's not like you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to burn a lot of fat now, right? So the body doesn't work like that. The body loves carbohydrates because it just boom, 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 boom. It goes through them like crazy. So when we look at this, this nutrition roller coaster, this is your blood sugar curve. And this is, what, this is like a huge golden nugget to listen to. When your blood sugar roller coaster goes up and down, usually you don't feel good, right? Who has that afternoon crash between 1 and 4 p.m.? Okay. That is not because there's something wrong with you. You're just not controlling your blood sugar. Right? So you're on the bottom, you're coming down the roller coaster, now you're not feeling good, so now you have to eat something and you come back up, right? Usually that's the way it works. But when you're in this, this very fatigued state, very vulnerable state of low blood sugar, and you're feeling cloudy and you're feeling fuzzy and you're just getting a little cranky, what do you usually reach for? What types of foods? Sugar. Because your brain, so there's, there's a lot to do with this, but everyone says your brain runs only on sugar. Well, it doesn't doesn't have to, that is, but it wants sugar. So when you're in that vulnerable state, it's going to say, 
grab a piece of fruit, grab some, some chocolate, grab some can whatever it is, so it can feel better, right? It's a little protective mechanism. So then you, you come out of the roller coaster, you feel good, woo, 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 it's great. That's not a great way to live, you know why? Because every time your blood sugar peaks up here, there's this little hormone called insulin. You guys have heard of this? Not a bad hormone. It's one of its jobs is to actually take that high blood sugar that's, that's circulating around your bloodstream and put it back into your body, put it back into your cells. Perfect. It's the way our body is made. But if you continually go through this roller coaster, up, down, up, down, high blood sugar is high blood insulin. Once insulin does its job, blood sugar will get into the cells and you'll be stable again. But for how long depends on what you're eating. But here's the thing. Whenever your, high, your blood sugar is high, your blood insulin is high. This funny looking thing, does anyone know what that is? It's your pancreas. So here's how I relate this. If I sat here for the next 45 minutes and just did this, what would happen? What's that? What you, someone would really get sick of it, probably me included, right? What else may happen? Is there anyone next? No. There's gonna, well, if I'm strong enough, but this, this is kind of solid right here, right? There's either going to be a hole in the wall or I'm going to have bloody knuckles. Exactly. Desensitizes and it stresses my knuckle or the wall. The more your blood sugar goes up and down, the more it stresses or desensitizes your pancreas, which means you become insulin resistant. When you become insulin resistant, that may sound familiar because that is what? Diabetes. Diabetes. So the more you overwork this organ, the more susceptible you are to a disease state, to a very popular disease state in the United States. How do you prevent that? You stabilize this curve through the food you eat. There's, again, there's no special thing here. There's no pills, powders, or potions that you need to buy. It's how to navigate the grocery store a little better, right? And that's, again, what I'm teaching you. So the more up and down you have, the more stressed your pancreas, the more cranky you get, the less energy you have. You're reaching for sugar, you're reaching for caffeine when you don't really need to. Okay. All right, so at the end of the day, it really is about blood sugar. We've got our happy blood sugar line, which is the red dotted one, and we have our unhappy blood sugar line. Now, sometimes you're going to have a ha an unhappy blood sugar line. We know that, right? You're going to make a mistake. You're going to be vulnerable. That's okay. That's that healthy relationship with food. Eat your chocolate. Eat your pizza, your potato chips, whatever, right? But do so when you're not vulnerable. And you shouldn't justify it either. Do you know that? Oh, well, I worked out today, so I'm going to have a piece of pizza. No, if you want a piece of pizza, eat a piece of pizza, right? That's that healthy relationship of food I was talking about. So how do we do this? Well, that's not how we do it. That's just the science behind it. So you know that I'm not actually making this stuff up, right? Basic Biochemistry 101. Go look in Harper's Biochemistry, my beloved textbook for my graduate studies, Harper's Biochemistry. And it will show you this. What happens when insulin is high and inhibits this thing called lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat. All it means is when your blood sugar is high and insulin is high, you're turning off your body's ability to burn fat. And if that's your goal, so be it. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm going to tell you that's probably not the best thing to do. right? So when we look at this, it's all about food, 75% of it, right? There's your second golden nugget, protein, fiber, and fat. Now I'm going to teach you how to do this right now. So you guys know what proteins are, right? Name some proteins for me, protein food sources. Chicken, Chicken steak, pork, pork egg. fish, soy products, eggs, eggs beans, beans, nuts, beans. tofu, seeds, <laughs> right? There's actually a lot of protein, cheese, right? There's a lot of protein sources out there. So what are some fiber sources? Vegetables. Vegetables. Flax. Flax, yeah. So let's go with the big ones first. Veggies, fruit, and whole grains. Then you can start going into the, the specifics, right? So veggies, name it. Fruit, name it. Whole grains, oh, wait a second. So my white pasta, is that a whole grain? My white rice, is that a whole grain? Not saying there's anything wrong with it, but we have to be particular with the grains that we put in our body, right? So triticale, amaranth, buckwheat, those are grains. Like if you're gonna eat a grain, eat the grain grain. But sometimes it doesn't taste good, does it? You know, it's kind of dry, it's kind of crunchy, right? Quinoa is, is kind of a, a mix in between. Has great protein in it, yep. So when we talk, and then fat, fat sources. I mean, just about everywhere. However, remember back in the days, and I said this earlier, saturated fat is not a bad guy. We need saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat, 
So we need butter. We need bacon. Is anybody a vegetarian? No? Yeah? Okay, that's why you said the soy. That's, that's, why, that's why I was pointing you. Okay, so, so we need that kind of fat, but fat comes from almost every animal source too. Like what? Like steak, like chicken, like fish. Dairy products, cheese, right? So we're getting fat. Not getting fat. We're, we're consuming fats, right? Fat can also be found in what? Nuts, seeds, avocado, dragon fruit. You guys know dragon fruit? It's actually a really good source of omega-3 fats, anti-inflammatory fats. Yeah, Tastes good, but it's very expensive, right? Um, so we look at this and we say, okay, if 75% of this equation is protein, fiber, and fat, what is he talking about? Well, this is what I'm talking about. This is my golden nugget number three for you. So I've devised this very simple way of teaching people how to eat. And, and bear with me here, because I usually, I can talk on this topic for at least eight to 10 hours, but we're condensing everything, right? So I'm going to give you one golden nugget here that you can actually take home with you and use. So I call it my car CHO is carbohydrate to protein ratio and or the hand model. So here's what I'm going to teach you today. One hand, look at, look at your hand right now, right? One hand is defined as wrist to the fingertips. Usually hand size is kind of depictable with in, re in relationship to your body size most of the time, right? So this is how I teach it. One hand is protein. Whatever protein you want. I don't care what you like, eat it, right? The other hand is fiber. Oh, here's where we get a little bit interesting, right? If you want weight loss, make most of that fiber come from veggies. If you don't want weight loss, it's a balance of veggies, fruit, and whole grain, right? But anyway, the fiber hand is, is vegetables, it's fruit, it's whole grain. Now it gets a little bit weird sometimes, right? Because like for salad, whatever you can grab. If you're gonna eat an apple, it's usually one apple, right? Depends on the size of the apple, okay? But if you look at this, so, so did anyone eat dinner yet tonight? You pick up, okay, what, what'd you have? I had salad yep. and lobster ravioli. Okay, so salad and lobster ravioli. Where's the protein? Did you see why I asked that first? Why did I ask that first? Uh, we will always find the carbs, believe me. In our society, there's no shortage of them. But when you, when you navigate to the, the store or home or the pantry or the fridge or whatever, always think, where's my protein first? So when, when, when Mira said lobster ravioli, I said, oop, lobster, picked it out. Then my next question was, what should I ask? Where's the fiber? And what did she say first? Salad, right? So I'm assuming it was a good salad, that's the fiber source. But here's how I actually want you to answer that question. If I had lobster ravioli in salad, right, I would say I had lobster that was in ravioli with salad. And I know it sounds really weird, but a lot of the nutrition game is psychological. So, and, and this is a, not that I condone this, but if anyone eats cereal, right, this is how I have people make their cereal if they eat cereal. What goes in the bowl first? The milk. Because that's your protein. And it sounds weird, doesn't it? You're like, whoa, wait, wait, wait. Remember I said I was gonna make you a little uncomfortable, right? You, put, you don't put milk in a bowl first for cereal. Who does that? We do that, right? It's changing the paradigm of how you approach nutrition. So now you've got your protein source, and where does the fiber source come from? Hopefully you've made, I mean, hopefully it's a cereal. <laughs> So cereal is a weird example, right? But hopefully it's like a whole grain cereal, right? Kashi cereal, something like that. However, that is not going to meet our ratios. But you kind of see where I'm going with this protein, fiber, and fat. So now there are these ratios. And this comes from diabetes research. Research in people with diabetes. And I don't know if you know a lot about diabetes, but they kind of have to do what? They have to watch their, their, their blood sugar. They have to test their blood sugar. So this comes straight from their research. So we know if your hands can be one-to-one, -one, Protein, fiber, and you eat that, you put that on a plate in that quantity, and that may seem like a lot of, a lot of uh, protein for some of you. For some of you, you're like, no, that's nothing, right? You put that on a plate, that will stabilize your blood sugar in an ideal amount. Even if you do two hands of carbohydrate, right? It's the, it's the carbohydrate to protein ratio. So two hands of fiber, carbohydrate, to one hand of protein, you're still controlling your blood sugar pretty well but it's when you get into three to one to four to one, that's when we start having some issues. And I'm not saying it's bad, but you see in here when we should probably use them. Now with these higher ratios of carbohydrate, we're looking at the workouts. That's the nutrition periodization. If our workouts are long or super intense for 90 minutes or more, then maybe we do need more carbohydrate, absolutely. 
But if they're shorter in duration or less intense, maybe we do need to gravitate toward, more towards one-to-one -one or two-to-one. So you're going to have to do homework here, right? You're going to have to go home and figure out this whole hand model thing. Then you're going to look in your fridge, in your pantry, and be like, all right, you may even, if you're really type A, is anyone type A in here? If you're really type A, you'll categorize your pantry and your fridge. I've had people do this before. So like this section is protein in the fridge, and this section is, I mean, we already do it with fruits and veggies, right? You guys have fruit and veggie drawers? So why not do it with protein? I mean, if you're that type A. I'm type A too, right? It's okay, right? So is this, this kind of making sense on how to eat? So here's another way of thinking of it. This is my food list. So when you populate your list of proteins and fats that you enjoy, not because someone says you should eat it, because you enjoy it, what happens? What happens when you have foods here and foods here and foods here? And we'll talk about misses here in a second. That becomes your shopping list, which becomes your meal planning list. Because here's the thing with this. We're following that one-to-one -one or two-to-one, -one, that hand ratio, right? 90% of your time is in the red box. 10% of your time is in the blue dotted box. You have to include misses in your daily nutrition plan. You have to, because that develops a healthy relationship with food. If you say, I can't, I won't, what happens later? Guarantee you will overdo it and you'll binge. And you're going to go crazy and then you're going to feel bad and every, it's just going to blow up, right? So you might as well say, wow, you know, I like chocolate. I'm going to have some chocolate. I'm not going to overdo the chocolate. I'm going to enjoy the chocolate very slowly. For those of you who, who eat chocolate, you know what I'm talking about? Like, let it melt in your mouth because that's what you need. You need those taste receptors to send the signals to your brain to induce that happy feeling, right? So once you have your list, you eat from the left to the right. And that's just what I talked about with the bowl of cereal, right? So where's my protein for, source first? Usually, unless you're trying to follow a high-fat diet, you don't have to really worry about where the fat is because normally it's in protein sources most of the time. Unless you're doing the crazy thing and you're going to the grocery store and you're buying no fat products, no fat yogurt, no fat cottage cheese, disgusting no fat, you know, cheese, which is rubber, right? Yeah. Do you count like nut butter as a protein? That's a very good question. So nuts and nut butter and seeds are fairly balanced in carbs, protein, and fat, right? So it can kind of kind of go along all three, right? But it is a protein source but it also is a source of fiber. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have a good relationship with, all, yeah. Well, and here's a, here's a good point. Like if you guys snack throughout the day, so a lot of people will choose like a nut butter sometimes to snack with, which could be dangerous. It's like nuts, right? If you're gonna have nuts, you better be careful because you could, you guys know this, you, until the bag or the, the jar is gone, you're like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? It's the same thing with nut butter. So, but like for a snack, everyone thinks you have to have, you have to pair something. But like nut butter is a great example, or nuts or seeds. You can have that alone as a snack, and it'll control your blood sugar really well. But then you have to ask the question, am I eating too much? So, right, so there's a volume thing there, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's where the hand model gets a little sticky, because if you're eating yogurt, uh, uh, or like nut butter, don't, don't, no, no, don't do that much, right? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. You're like, he told me to have a whole handful of nut butter. That's fantastic. I like that presentation. Yeah, yeah. So there are a few things that you kind of have to navigate. For those things, you should do the serving size, which is usually two tablespoons, right? Yeah. Oh, you were bummed. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> it is. You have, like, with those, you have to go completely natural and nothing, nothing except peanuts and oil, right? But it's tricky because sometimes, I mean, we just say, we just off the shelf are like, oh, that's peanut butter or whatever it is. But you have to look at the label these days because they're jacking it up with sugar. Why? Because you buy it? Because you know the three top things that drive you to buy food or to order something at restaurants or just to eat? Salt, sugar, and fat, right? And so manufacturers, food manufacturers know this, especially with sugar these days. They will jack it up, and especially if they're pulling stuff out. Like, remember, remember back in the days, the low-fat craze? All they did was add a whole bunch of sugar. That's it, right? Shane? Question from online. Yeah. Oh, good. So should you count, so first question, should you count protein grams? Well, that goes to the big question, should you count all grams? I don't, I don't condone it, and I don't support it. If you want to, then you can. However, 
you will get into a very, very bad cyclical pattern of always needing to count. So back to that, remember I said earlier that instinctual eating? You don't have to count anything once you get to the point of trusting your body when it's hungry and what foods you should eat. However, we've lost that ability as adults. All right? How many of you have kids? So when they're infants, when they were infants, what happened when they were hungry? They, well, we probably overate too, right? We're like, oh yeah, I gotta get a little bit of this. What, what happens when a baby's hungry? What do they do? Cry. They cry, they cry. And as, as parents, we're like, oh, there's a bottle, right? So they have that, they have instinctual eating already wired. They cry, they get food, but they know when they're hungry because they're crying. Now, sometimes we, as adults, we could cry when we're hungry, we just normally don't, right? But as we age, as we get into our teens especially, so we're, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking in the audience, we're way past that stage, right? We're, no one's in their teens here, right? We lose the ability to know when we're hungry and know when we're full. So I don't really support counting calories or counting grams because the first step in this whole process is first teaching you how to come back to instinctual eating. Once you have that, to that question, then you can start counting if you really want to. Really, really want to. So what, to the second question, what happens if I just eat all protein? You can't. It, it would be impossible, right? I would actually challenge someone to do that because protein sources also have what? Fat, right? So you're also gonna, you're always gonna get at least two of the macronutrients, right? Unless you're just doing like a protein powder, and that would just kind of be disgusting, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, now that said, off on the tangent, there's actually a researcher, a good friend of mine in South Miami, who's doing really good research on high protein diets, and has found great, like no, no detrimental effects of bumping up protein, but they're still eating carbs and fat too but they're actually going super high with protein and saying, well, there's no effects on kidney damage. There's nothing going on here. However, all of us are individuals, right? He's studying the very, very fit population in mostly collegiate um, because that's, that's his population he has to work with right now, right? Make sense? Yeah? Yes. Should there be a limit on fat compared to protein? Ah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 I would, I would say it's, it's more of a, the easy answer is no. The complex answer is I would need to see medical health, health history, you know, blood like work. Cauliflower yeah. Mac and cheese. You make it oh real, yeah. Yeah. Real yeah. Better, real heavy. Absolutely. Yeah. I would promote that because it's stabilizing your blood sugar better. And the cauliflower is getting, I mean, that's, that's very balanced actually. It is a little bit heavier on the fat, a little bit lighter on the carbs, but depending on what you're going for, in lighter on protein, exactly. Depending on what you're going for, it could be okay. I mean, I literally, like, like I'm, I started working with this, this particular individual who is consuming, what is she consuming? I think it was 24 to 2,500 calories a day. And I only know this because she shared my fitness pal, her log with me. So I, of course I'm looking at it, right? And I'm looking at it and she's, she was put on a ketogenic plan, right? Um, by, this, by this other person, under 40 grams of, of carbohydrate a day. She's eating She's, she's five foot three, 115 pounds, just to give you an idea. She's eating about 100 grams of protein and 220 grams of fat. So about 76% of her calories is coming from fat. Is she unhealthy? Absolutely not. Blood work shows great stuff. Her dex, I mean, she's done all, she's actually a physician, right? She's done all the scans, all the, all the blood work, everything. But what I'm gonna tell you is some of us are predisposed to be better at fat burning and better at carbohydrate burning from a genomic standpoint. So some of us actually have genes that will, that will give us more opportunity to tap into fat stores. So you can handle that, right? And others, a little more sensitive to that. I haven't actually found a lot of people who are more sensitive to fat burning than they are carbohydrate burning. Usually everyone is, is mostly open to that, teaching your body to burn more fat, yeah. Okay. So then the question becomes, can you test this? Of course you can test it, right? Yes. If you don't test, what are you doing? You're just guessing. And, and I'll tell you, I work with people all around the country, all around the world, via email, Skype, telephone. Sometimes they don't have a testing facility. So what do I do as their sport dietitian? Well, I do a little bit of guessing, but I've been doing this long enough to know where I should start and to decrease that learning curve. But I will tell you this, just like blood work, just like functional movement, just like anything, if you can get tested, oh my it, you can actually validate if your nutrition plan is actually working for you. So you may feel great, but wow, I haven't been able to lose the weight or I haven't been able to change my body comp or my performance is stagnant. 
then something is going on. Like, look at your training, your exercise, but also look at the nutrition piece. So let me show you. I've, I've taken you through this journey, right? Let me show you what testing will actually give you because it's a wow factor, absolutely wow factor. So this is, remember I showed you those earlier graphs, right? So the blue line is always your carbohydrate burning. So let me just explain this. This was a female fitness enthusiast, not an athlete, just, just a lady who works out three days a week, right? Has a family, has a job, works out, right? So we started her walking. This is a walking, actually, no, it wasn't. A little bit of running protocol, kind of a slower running protocol. So you see the miles per hour. Each dot is four minute stage. So this is going from low intensity exercise to high intensity exercise. Now the high intensity isn't really high intensity. Don't let that scare you, right? This test is actually the complete opposite protocol of a VO2 max test, if you guys know what that is. That, that VO2 max test is an eight to 12 minute test. You run or bike as fast as you can and you go until you barf, right? This is the exact opposite. We start so slow because we don't want to miss where these would cross, if they cross. And this lady, unfortunately, was what? much more efficient at using her carbohydrate stores, which men, meant that she's storing more fat. And her goals were specifically weight loss and body composition changes. Her nutrition plan was not supporting it. Her exercise was fine. She was walking, she was doing some strength, no issues with that at all, but her exercise program, or her nutrition program was completely off. So let me show you what can, I don't have a pre and post for her, but I've got some pre and post for some other, so you can see the impact of this. So a lot of data up here. Don't, don't worry about half this stuff, but we've got the time. So every stage on this test was, was five minutes. So we went up five minutes. You can see the miles per hour increased, the running pace, the heart rate. You don't need to know that stuff. What we look at is this is the first step of developing or, or of knowing what is going on in your body. So with this guy, this was a male triathlete and ultra runner, right? Ultra crazy. This was a few years ago. He was vegetarian. Nothing wrong with vegetarian. Nothing wrong with veganism, right? It has to suit what you want. So we tested him, and this is where his metabolic efficiency point was. So he had one, but I look at this and say, ah, oh, there's not a lot to the left here. Remember to the left is burning more fat? So for him, he was constantly burning more carbohydrate as in the intensity increased. So for me, I could say, well, from an exercise perspective, which is only a quarter of this equation, just run slower than an 827 minute mile or a heart rate of less than 137 and you're, you'll burn more fat because that's what, our, what's what our test is telling us, great. But that's not really the whole point of this. The whole point is to say, what are you doing from a food standpoint? So what do we know about vegetarians? And it's not picking on you, right? No, no. They, they, it's a lower protein intake because their protein sources are usually carbohydrate sources, especially if they're pure vegan, are you pure vegan? Okay. 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 So you have some, some animal protein. Yeah. Which is, which is fantastic because it makes this so much easier. Right. But what I'll tell you is vegetarianism, while healthy for some individuals, will teach your body to actually oxidize or burn more fat or burn more carbohydrate, not fat. It's not a bad thing if that's what you want to be, if that's what you want. Absolutely. But look what can happen if you change your nutrition plan. What just happened to those lines? Blue carb, red fat. They imposed, didn't they? Wait a second, did you guys catch the date? Let's go back. That's four weeks. That's a four week nutrition intervention. However, this is what I need to tell you. This guy was me. I was a vegetarian for 10 years. I don't know why, I just was. Like no ethical things, I'm a dietitian. I'm like, yeah, might as well try it, why not, right? People are asking me about it, let's just see. 10 years later, I was like, oh, I'm still a vegetarian. So I did some testing on myself and I did, I'm not going to show you the blood work today, but the reason I did this experiment was because my family history is very, very poor when it comes to blood lipids, high, high risk for cardiovascular disease and diabetes in my family line. And I knew that because my blood lipid panel was bad, right? Especially on a vegetarian diet. So anyway, that's what drove me to this experiment. So I went and I do not recommend this because it's really hard to do. From one day to the next day, I went from vegetarian to non-vegetarian. <laughs> it's actually pretty cool. Like, it was, it was fun eating meat again, right? Was like, no, no, no. I, I did slowly reintroduce meat because I didn't know about the enzymes and, and what was lost or decreased. So I just wanted to take it slow. But the point is what I did, I didn't change my, my exercise much, right? Actually, I was, just, I was really just running at that point, right? A little bit of strength on the side, but really running. 
but I changed my nutrition plan to an animal protein diet, but I did flip my carbs, my protein, my fat. So obviously I had more protein on an animal protein diet, right? I decreased my carbohydrates from 500 grams a day to under 100. And there was no sweet spot, I just, I just picked that because, right? But I had to increase my fat significantly. So if you ever do this, think of it as a teeter-totter. You guys remember a teeter-totter, you go up and down on either side? The middle, what holds the teeter-totter? It's your fulcrum. That's protein. Protein usually doesn't move around that much unless you're trying to do a high-protein diet. Once you find protein that you need in your body, you're there. What changes is carbohydrate and fat. So I made the mistake, I dropped my carbs, but I didn't increase my fat. I was so flippin' hungry, it wasn't even funny. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what's going on? Am I doing this wrong? Of course I was, I didn't add enough fat. But I was a little fat phobic, because I was taught in school, high carb, low fat, right? So I started adding more fat and more fat. So four weeks later, you see what happened. This is just metabolic efficiency. All my blood lipids flipped and reversed. The good, the good went up, the bad went down. Fantastic. That is why I am not a vegetarian anymore. And it's nothing wrong with vegetarianism, but for my body, that wasn't working. And I proved it, but this is insane, isn't it? I don't even cross, and in fact, I don't know if you guys looked at this. Look at the last stage right here. It's a 644 minute per mile, 8.9 miles per hour, right? Look what happens, where's the last stage? So I went faster, I completely debunked everyone who says you cannot burn fat at high intensities. How was I able to go one stage farther, faster, and still burn 61% of my energy from fat? Because I taught myself how to increase the ability to burn fat through eating a bit more balanced carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Yes. Interesting, isn't it? Well, why didn't I see that? I could predict where my cross, my, my metabolic efficiency point would be, but I couldn't get there because I was so darn tired. I was like, you know, listen, I'm not training for speed. I couldn't, I couldn't go faster than a 631 minute per mile because I wasn't training for speed. It wasn't that time of the year because it was November, right? Interesting, right? Hmm. Well, how about this? This guy was phenomenal. This is not me, but so this is, this is a guy who came into me, it was a year and a half ago and we did a test. He was, you know, he was actually a, a teacher a uh, cross-country coach, and he said, listen, I just want to, I want to burn more fat. I just, you know, he was, he didn't have a body weight issue, no body, body composition issues, but he just wanted to be better efficient at burning fat, right, storing carbohydrate. So we tested him, this is test one, and you see where his metabolic efficiency point was. Everything to the left, this was part of my prescription to him. 25% of this equation is exercising, respecting your low intensity exercise. So now we have designated paces or heart rate zones to actually use to increase fat adaptation. But the big part was his nutrition, right? We flipped, he was a complete carbohydrate junkie. We flipped that around a little bit. Didn't go on ketogenic, we didn't need that, right? We just needed to decrease his carbs, put his protein where it needed to be, and put his fat where it needed to be. We needed to balance him out. And here's what happened, this was, oh, this is another slide I needed to show you. I'm so sorry, I'm jumping ahead. This is actually part of the test that you get from this. This will show you not only the total calories that you burn per hour at each pace or heart rate, but also where the calories are coming from. So now you're like, oh, well, if my heart rate's 144 um, beats per minute, 368 of those calories is coming from fat. 277 is coming from carbohydrate. Can I ask you, yeah. Um, about the test itself, mm -hmm. I don't understand, how do you measure Great question, I, I didn't even explain that. Thank you for, for asking. So it's an, it's an easy, like I said, very low intensity to moderate intensity. As you've seen up here, the stages are four to five minutes, increase intensity every four to five minutes, and you either walk slash run on a treadmill or bike on a bike, right? So you are actually breathing into a mouthpiece or a mask hooked up to a metabolic cart that is collecting all this data, right? So I have actually real-time data to show you these numbers real time. So I'm collecting and I'm developing these nice spreadsheets. Calculate carbo, carb burn versus fat burn. Exactly, exactly. Oxygen. Yeah, so, it's, so the relationship, so I didn't want to get too technical, but you're asking, so I'm gonna get technical. Uh, it's called, so we look at your RER. Sometimes it's called RQ, but RER is respiratory exchange ratio. That's the association of oxygen consumption versus carbon dioxide production. And that's what the metabolic cart does with your breath, with your air, yep. Once we have that, then I've got, I've got all these beautiful data up here. 
So we get a little more specific, but, but even cooler, like for this runner, because he's a runner, right? He's like, well, I'm going for a run. How many calories should I eat per hour or drink per hour? And I said, oh, I can answer that question, right? This tells you exactly how many calories, 65 to 194, 68 to 203, whatever it is, based on heart rate or pace, exactly how many calories that person should consume per hour. Now, I need to tell you this in context. Traditional research, current research, research indicates that you should consume between 120 and 360 calories per hour. Well, okay, wait a second. What did I just say? 120 to 360. Why isn't that matching up? Because physiologically we are different at different places, right? This will change. These numbers will change as you burn more fat and preserve carbohydrate. You'll actually need fewer calories per hour. So out of the days, like if you're an endurance guy or gal running half marathons or 10Ks or whatever, out of the days where you have to overfeed yourself during a session or during a race. But this gets more specific into actually providing that prescription for you. So not only do we determine, are you burning more fat or carbohydrate, but then we look into the data a little bit more. Okay. That's the same guy three months later. Three months. Now, he did exercise. He did all of his training in under that specific heart rate to the left of his metabolic efficiency point. He's very, very good at that. But he also implemented more of a balance in his macronutrients, his protein, fiber, and fat. That is a huge difference, don't you think? Let's, let's just go back to where he was. Look at that. Same paces, if you, if you pay attention to this. He actually did three more stages three months later. This is the power of not only combining that exercise prescription, but the power of changing your daily nutrition. Not taking any supplements. He's just making smart decisions with his food. Hmm. Interesting, huh? Three months later, whoa, remember that first line, those first lines? See how much blue there is there? That's carbohydrate burning. Whoa, look at how much fat now he's going through. Meaning he's much more efficient at using fat as energy at higher intensities. So don't let anybody tell you that it's impossible to burn fat at high intensity. It's possible. It just depends on where your body is at. But it's possible. And I told you that the latest paper that just came out this year, 23 to 89% of max intensity, max heart rate, max VO2. Somewhere in between there, that's where you guys are sitting. You just don't know where, right? Okay. So I'm almost done. This is, this is how I explain testing. So a lot of people ask, ask and, and this is a, a shameless plug for myself, so excuse this. People ask, well, what test should I do? What, what's more important to me? Well, I, I start with your goals, right? I would never recommend anything to you that wouldn't meet your goals. So if you say, listen, I'm dialed into my nutrition, I'm good there, maybe we don't do a metabolic efficiency test. Maybe we do something else, right? So I'm not trying to tell you that you have to over test. I'm saying be very particular and, and choosy in what you choose for your test. Unfortunately, like when we go to a physician's office, what happens? Usually they determine the tests. That's not what I like to do. I like to determine that with you and say, what are your goals, right? What are you trying to accomplish? And then follow it down. And we, we haven't even talked about all these. We're just focusing on metabolic efficiency, right? But there's blood work testing. There's genomic testing. There's obviously body composition, sweat, sodium. There's, there's muscle fuel. I have a device now via ultrasound that I can measure the amount of carbohydrate that your body is storing. So I can measure your storage of carbs and how many carbs you're burning. Oh, interesting, isn't it? So now we really know what's going on with your body. So that was my short and sweet presentation. I don't wanna go on for another eight hours. Um, I will give you my contact info and I would love questions because I know I flew through this. My, again, golden nuggets, high blood sugar, high blood insulin. Knocking on your pancreas door, not good because it's turning off fat burning. You have to stabilize blood sugar each one of you will do it differently. The hand model, second golden nugget, will get you close to that if you can navigate that, right? A lot of people, it's, it's pretty simple to do, right? Sometimes you overthink it though, right? Third golden nugget, if you can test, don't guess, right? If you don't wanna test, that's fine too. Be weary of that hand model and use it most of the time, 90% of the time. 10% of the time, you gotta let things happen. Those misses will happen, right? Okay, Shane. 
Mm -hmm. Did I? Was that out loud? Sorry. Did you guys hear that? So juicing is really interesting because you're stripping the fruit of really what we need in the fruit, and that is fiber. I don't have an, I don't have an issue with juicing, except now you're losing one of the main nutrients that stabilizes blood sugar. So now you can juice, absolutely, but you better find some fiber and some protein somewhere else, and some fat somewhere else. So I'm fine if you're combining it, absolutely. But I don't, I don't understand. I just... Just a yeah, yeah, I mean, perfect. Like smoothies, fantastic. Put everything into a Vitamix or, or a, uh, what are they, ninjas, right? <laughs> Throw the whole thing in there. Go for it. Put vegetables in there. Smoothies are fantastic because you can make them with protein, with fiber, and with fat. So not a big fan of juicing, not that it's a bad thing, but there are better ways, better ways. As Jackie was just asking, um, sometimes when you get on a whole food, or a whole 30 plant, yep, yep. Um, they get really hungry. Yes. So does that mean low fat? That was your question. Exactly, yeah. So usually when, I mean, and not even picking on a plan, but if you get hungry, which I did not tell you guys earlier, I, I, I apologize, Biological hunger will signal your body to eat something about every three hours, give or take a few minutes. That's how our bodies in a non-diabetic state, that's way, how we work. So if you're getting hungry every one hour, every 90 minutes, every two hours, your macronutrients are off. So either you have lower protein or lower fat. Those are usually the, the two cases, right? So think about it, think, wow, I do get hungry every two hours. That is a traditional high carbohydrate diet person. Absolutely. And I'm not saying that's bad yet, right? There are a lot of young people that, that just, they're, they're just, they can do anything, right? In their teens, in their 20s, maybe even their 30s. And they get towards the end of their 30s and 40s and they're thinking, maybe I'm not able to do everything, right? So a lot of times we need to think in this context of our aging continuum. What is right for us versus even our kids? That's a whole different presentation is, is nutrition for young people whole different presentation. While we still want to control blood sugar, we, they need different nutrients than us because they're going through growing growth and we're kind of coming off of that. Okay. What are you going to do that one? Whenever we want to. I would love to. Yes. I definitely want to yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually a fun one because a lot of parents are like, what? Oh my God. Because sometimes it requires different meal planning in the household depending on how the kids are, are going through their developmental process. Ah, yeah. Yeah, so here's the thing with, so intermittent fasting, there's, there's a few protocols on this, right? Some, and I've done a lot of reading on this, uh, the research is still in its infancy. You guys should know that initially. A lot of people are doing a lot of crazy things with intermittent fasting. Some are doing it correctly, some are not. Intermittent fasting basically says between, the, the typical one is between 16 and 24 hours, you don't eat anything right? You drink some water, stay hydrated. Some people do greens powder and electrolytes to try to keep some sodium balance and electrolyte balance. Um, it, it absolutely will reset some things if done frequently. And that's what some of the, the, the initial research has said. So great for growth hormone, great for actually stabilizing blood sugar, being more sensitive to, to insulin and some hormones. So it's I would say it's not a negative thing, but I've seen some people do it incorrectly and they're doing it like every two or three days and they're really getting into a really vicious cycle. That can start tagging your metabolic rate, which as we age, what happens to our metabolic rate? It slows down. So if you're constantly doing that, you could tag it in a negative way. If you're doing it correctly, it could actually raise that a little bit and be your friend. Has anyone tried that before? Yeah, you're doing it now? Yeah, yeah, you feel okay? Yeah. 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 Usually. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like some people will try to go into ketosis and do a, a 72 hour fast. Now I haven't done that, but power to those people trying to do that. I've heard it's rough the first two days. I don't know if that's what you did or not, but I'm just, I'm doing, uh, 16, hours. 16 hours. Yeah. 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 And I'll tell you that that isn't bad to be honest with you, because if you think about how much, how much you sleep and the fact that you probably shouldn't eat a lot after dinner, cause it could disrupt your sleep pattern you probably got a good 12 hours right there, right? So you're probably just eating lunch, right? That's when your first meal, right? Somewhere in there, yeah, yeah. I have a question on, um, as far as that is, you know, generally if I'm at the firehouse, I, I'll eat at noon, mm -hmm. but then I'll come to the noon class yep. and I'm off the shift. Yep. So I'll be in a fasted state mm -hmm. for my workout. Right, right, right. Just from what I've read, as yeah. far as the fat oxidization, 
organization mm -hmm. and all that. I mean, yep. is, that is that true? So y yes, it's, so it's fasted training is what you're talking about. Yes, it is. However, you need to think about what lean mass you want. So we, we look at that like because you're coming here for strength, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to protect lean mass and you don't want to. So there's this, in, in the protein world, you want to maintain net, net uh, protein synthesis, right? So we usually bookend a little bit of carbs, a little bit of protein before a strength workout and after to preserve that net protein synthesis because you're going to lose some depending on the type of class that you do. So in a fasted state, you could risk losing more of that unless you eat right afterwards right. right and then then it's fine yeah, yeah absolutely but that's like and that's a great question because whatever exercise you guys do you have to think should i do it fasted or not and that if nobody has a question about that i'll just pose that question so i can answer it right there's a lot of research being done on that these days but still again it's in its infancy they are looking at people who are eating a higher carb diet and they're saying it's helpful to go into some sessions fasted because it sensitizes you more Right? It actually improves fat oxidation and all these great markers of health, but these are on high carb people. Right? It's not necessarily on the lower carb or the metabolically efficient or even the keto people. Right? So that part we just don't know. Um, when it comes back to it, if you wake up in the morning and you're not hungry, there's a question you have to answer. Should I eat? I mean, and, and I can't tell you the answer to that because you have to look at what you're doing during the day. Sometimes you should eat. Sometimes you should just listen to your body, get, regain that instinctual eating and say, I'm not hungry, I'm going to wait, right? And that's probably what you've gotten to. You're not hungry in the morning, I would, I would I mean, guess. I'm, I'm fresh on it, but yeah. it's, uh, it's mostly I got on it because I eat like a raccoon in a Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had yeah. To, you know, I got up in the morning right. and then it was breakfast. Yep, yep, then, you know, yep, you exactly. And it's like, oh, hey, look at exactly. delicious treats. Yes, and yes. This at least is, uh, yeah. you know, kind of exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come here. So I have a new holistic doctor. Mm -hmm. She yep. did all the blood work and yeah. the lipid panels and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Now her theory, it's a little different than yours, so yeah. I wanted to get your philosophy yep. on that. Yep. Her theory is like, you know, so she also had the whole insulin thing mm -hmm. and this and that. And right. She said you need to be at the very bottom yeah. to burn fat. Oh. And so, yeah. which means yeah. hungry, not feeling right. Right, 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 right. So I, I, would, I would just add to that that at the bottom, you are burning fat, uh -huh. but you may not be feeling well, right? right. But at, at the top, remember at the top of the, the blood sugar line, uh -huh. your insulin is high, you, aren't, you are not burning fat. Uh -huh. Somewhere in between is your sweet spot. So you want, in, in my world, you try to catch that blood sugar line going down before it becomes detrimental. And so, and that's my second question, yeah. because then I brought up, because you had promoted yeah. a product called UK. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And it, you know, it brings Absolutely. it up to a stable exactly. level. So I exactly. said, well, I'm taking that yeah. in my smoothie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And she's like, well, I'm not so sure, because then you're higher on oh, average, yeah. and I'm not sure if you're going to hit your yeah, stage. yeah. You you will in that because there's there, I mean there's great. If you guys haven't heard, let me just just open this up. Yeah. Have you guys heard of this this product called Generation You Can before? It's it's a powder. It's it's a just briefly. It's a the main set is a powder that has a what they call a super starch. So it's a it's a non-GMO corn starch that they cook in water and it elongates the strand of of the molecule of corn which makes it slower burning, if you will, right? And they actually have research, and this is why I would go back to her and say, there's actually research on this product, which not many products do, by the way. Um, to, like, they compared that versus maltodextrin before a workout. And this Generation UCAM product actually stabilizes blood sugar, whereas maltodextrin, which is a sugar, increases blood sugar. So there, there are, I mean, this, that's probably the only exception in a product that A, has research that B, supports fat burning, right? Yeah. So if you're, I mean, if you're going to use a product like that, I mean, you know me, I wholeheartedly recommend that one. But here's the thing too, like you can promote fat burning through food, right? But sometimes we're, it's, it's not as convenient. Sometimes we're on the go. Sometimes we need something, right? But you can even get bars out there in stores. Use this one-to-one -one ratio. So does anyone have one with them? Does anyone have a bar? Anything with a label on them? Michelle's got something. Throw it up here. What do we got? Oh, don't throw the canister. Okay. Okay, so this is a protein bar. Simple truth, protein bar. So the first thing, so here's, here's the hand model, right? The first thing you look at is what? Protein. So I'm going to look on here, and it has... Wait. 
wait, wait for it, wait for it. It's up where I can't read it. Where the heck is protein? Oh, 21 grams, 21 grams of protein. So I'm like, all right, I'm not gonna make a case for it yet until I go to what? Carbohydrate, sure, right? So we can look at total carbs first, then you can look at sugar. So I'm gonna go right to carbohydrate because if I'm following a one-to-one -one model, I would expect how many carbohydrates in here? No more than 21. If I'm following a two-to-one, it would be 42, right? So I'm gonna look at carbs and it says 14 grams of carbs. So what did that just tell me? It has more protein than carbohydrate. It has very little sugar. Actually, it has seven grams of sugar, which is low for a bar. And fat, it has eight grams. So Michelle, you get gold star for the day for this, this pick. Yeah, yeah. So, but, oh, now you're gonna make me read the ingredients, aren't you? That's the really small print, thank you very much. Protein blend, blah, blah. Okay, so I could, then you go to the ingredients, you're like, okay, I can really start picking on it. But we don't want to do that yet, right? Um, <laughs> you should, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree, especially if it's a yeah. corn syrup, tapioca starch. You get a little bit there, yeah. So my point is, on the on the big overall overall level, not bad for balancing blood sugar. Then you can move to the ingredients and say, okay, what kind of stuff are they putting in there, right? And I wouldn't say, I mean, you you can't qualify food as good or bad unless you're talking like trans fats, and that's just bad. It's just really bad, right? The food interacts with our bodies very differently from you to you to you to you, right? But as a, as a whole, this has the proper ratio of nutrients that will stabilize your blood sugar. Then you need to make the decision, do I eat this or do I eat food? Because cause this is really, if you think about it, it is a supplement of food, right? And any type of bar is a supplement. Do you guys know that? Absolutely, any energy food, is a, is a bar. It could be a drink. It could be a bar, right? Now you can argue some of the bars on the market, they're just really smushed up fruit and nuts. So okay, again, I, I get that argument. But when you start seeing things on the ingredient label, and you're like, whoa, that, is that in food? I'm not quite sure. I'm not even quite sure what that word is, right? Then you start questioning, ah, I'm not quite sure about that, right? But, but my point is you can do that with anything that has a label. Just start looking at that one-to-one -one ratio or two-to-one ratio. Okay. Good questions. What else? I will give this back. You changed from the more uh, kind of less balanced yep. fat to uh, carb ratios. Yep, yep. What did that look like from like a macronutrient perspective change? Like you want numbers? Like, yeah, like I don't something know. like it was around the range. Know. So it was yeah. all just based on kind of measurements. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can I get. I guess more fat to carb. Than exactly. Protein yeah, yeah. Is much the protein same. is usually stable, and then the fat to carb kind of. But you can't. Because the energy value of carbohydrate and fat is different, four calories per gram for carb, nine calories per gram, which is not true, by the way, but that's another presentation. There are not four calories per gram for carbohydrate or protein, and there are not nine for fat. Yeah, those are estimates. Those are rounded numbers. Oh, but did you know those process differently in the body? So we really don't know. Anyway, back to your question. Um, it's, it's, there, there's a balance because you can't say, okay, I'm going to take away 10 grams of carbs and 10 fat because the numbers are going to be off. So it's, 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 a, it's always, so nutrition planning is always an experiment, always, right? And you don't need fancy gadgets to tell you that. You start doing that teeter-totter and you'll know right away if you're eating every two hours, something's off. If you're eating every three hours, wow, we're getting close, right? So that, it's, it's, you can be very quantitative about it. I don't promote it, but I would help an individual do that if that's what they wanted to do. Absolutely. So ratio-wise, about what you should Are you talking do? percentage? Oh, well, yeah, I guess or, in terms of if you were like hand sizing or- Oh, I gotcha, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like well, it's, it's, to, yeah, it's um, kind of like the bar, right? So you're gonna have maybe a little bit more, or, or good protein, but the carb hand maybe shrinks and the fat hand opens up, right? That's like this lady that I'm working with right now, her carbohydrate hand is like a quarter to like three hands of fat. And then her protein is just right in the middle, pretty stable. But she's specifically ketogenic. Like that's her goal right now, right? Yeah. So, you know, obviously I've heard a lot about the yeah. Yeah, yeah. protein, especially for the endurance athletes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that said, yeah. I've been really working a lot of the, the slow mm -hmm. release sugar. Right, right, right. But I use mostly carbs mm -hmm. on my bike. Right, so right, right, yeah. So 
I should look more into them, more fat. Oh, that's a good question. So now you're talking about you're you're talking about nutrient timing during exercise. Right, during the so so here's the thing: during exercise, your body usually doesn't want a lot of fat during exercise. It doesn't want a lot of, doesn't want to consume a lot of fat because the intensity depends on on the intensity, of course. But it, once you get into moderate to high intensity, your body doesn't like oils and you know what I mean in nut butters it just doesn't process it well but if you're doing low intensity absolutely but that's why you know you guys when you're working out and it's just a little bit moderate to high intensity that's why you're putting sugar in your body because your body can actually process it very quickly because of the intensity but like a lot of ultra runners these days who are going really slow and they might be walking a lot they'll eat meals for God's sake right they're not doing a lot of energy bars or drinks because they're they're going slow enough to process protein to process fat Right? But for people who are going a little bit higher intensity, that's where the carbohydrates are important. And it's not like you should, you should steer clear of carbohydrates during, you shouldn't. But you should time it appropriately to when you actually need it for those workouts. Right? So I usually say, depending on the person, usually for workouts over 90 minutes or intense workouts, that's when you start looking at putting supplemental calories in your body. Yeah, but, but what I didn't tell you is, you know those carbohydrate stores you have in your body? That'll last you two to three hours of moderate intense exercise. Moderate. So if you're going super high intense, you might have an hour's worth of carbohydrate stores. But if you're going really low intense, you're going mean, to have a lot of hours worth of carbohydrate. But the whole thing is, if you teach your body to use more fat as energy, you preserve carbohydrate stores so you don't have to feed as many carbohydrate. Right? That's, that's the whole thing. All by the food, by controlling your blood sugar. Yep, and that that's. All about the, the balancing of the carbs. Yep, carb, protein, and fat. Yep. So that I mean, the take-home message is, balance your blood sugar to control to control it to optimize it. So hormonally, you control the insulin level, really, right? Do that all through food, all through food. So don't eat a banana by itself. Okay. Right? Because it's only fire. It's only sugar. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. And so to understand, sorry, real quick, yeah. just read that. So to understand the balance, yeah. I need to test? Or can I figure it out on my own? You could. It might take a while. But like, yeah, I yeah. can imagine, like, I would. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there are people that do that very successfully, but it takes months, if not right. years, to figure out, because then your exercise changes, and you're like, oh, my God, yeah. now what happens, right? right. right? Yeah, but if, I mean, it's, it's not to upsell this, but anytime you do any test, right. you learn more about where your body's at at that moment in time. And but, that. yeah, so exactly, right. yeah, 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 yeah. So, so once you test, you know where you are, and then I actually set a nutrition plan mm -hmm. to achieve your goals based on where physiologically your test is, right? right? Okay. Yeah, and that'll change, as you saw with so these tests. More fat, more exactly, yeah. Or, yeah, I can right. dial it in and say, okay, you're right here. We need to add or subtract okay. this to get to where you want to be. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what do you think of just going low sugar? I don't really know what that means. So in other words, you eat just, I guess, just your healthy protein, yep. fats, vegetables, yep. fruits. Yep, yep. So there's... You live with kind of fruits and, like, I, you know, for me, yeah. it kind of has worked well in the past. So, so I would define that as, as getting rid of refined sugars right. or eating low carbohydrate, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're talking about getting fruit out of there, maybe getting some grain, because grains, veggies, and fruits are all sugar, mm -hmm. right? But you're, you're probably talking about the refined sugars that get dumped into these products. That I would wholeheartedly support anytime you can, right? I mean, the more you can go from whole foods, not the store, but whole foods, right, the better, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you saw, like, with, with my example, yeah, you can so still, a lot of vegetarians just kind of, their, their lines meet very closely until a certain intensity. So you can absolutely teach yourself to be metabolically efficient following a vegetarian lifestyle. You just may not have those robust curves, right? But you're still burning more fat. But here's the thing with vegetarians. Some of them are doing it correctly. Like, they're dumping too many carbs in their body, right? And there's not a set amount. That's the beautiful thing about our bodies, but that's the confusing part is there's, I can't tell you a set amount, right? The amount that I usually recommend, it's, it's got about 100, it's got 90 to 100 gram swing range of carbohydrate. And that's to account for exercise, for, for genetics, for genomics, for body weight loss, for, I mean, you name it. So there's a huge range of carbohydrate, just like there is fat, there's a very small range for protein. But, but you would absolutely be able to do this. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm always cautious of mm -hmm. the protein. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
perfect, yeah. perfect, yeah. yeah. So you're probably already on the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Feel like yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just, you know, it's that snapshot. It's, it's the, I want to reduce cholesterol, but I don't know what my cholesterol is. But I'm going to eat based on what people tell me to reduce cholesterol. You just don't know if it's working for you or not. I knew a vegetarian diet for me did not, it actually increased my bad lipids and decreased my good ones. That's unfortunately, I mean, vegetarian diet was great. I mean, I loved it, except for what it did to me physiologically. Hmm. Question. Yeah. So what about the, the science that's out there mm -hmm. does yeah. talk about like these animal proteins mm -hmm. and the inflammation? Yeah. And yeah. The, I mean, well, there's, I, you know, I address that to say there's just as much research on vegetarian diets and certain foods that are grain-based that are inflam inflammatory. Well, but vegetarian yeah. diet. Yeah, so well, an that's you're not vegetarian, you're flexitarian then. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, I don't eat cheese, yeah exactly. Just yeah, work right, 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 right. A lot of times, I yeah. do know that vegetarians, yeah. they pour the cheese on because right. they've given up the meat. Exactly, so exactly. They're, they're feeling like, oh, I'm yeah. this up. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, but here's the thing you guys should also know about research, <laughs> if you don't know this already. I know Steve will share the same thought. There's a lot of bias in research. And, and in fact, it's, it's very frustrating in the nutritional world because one, there's a lot of stuff going on underneath the table, right, with funding and, and stuff. But even editorial boards, and this is going very, very viral in the nutrition world right now, the editorial boards are letting a lot slide based on outside interests. So just because one research says this, I mean, there'll be another 10 research studies to say the opposite. And we don't really know who to believe because then we look at statistical analysis, we look at power, we look at methodology, we look at the subjects. If the subjects aren't our age or our gender, typically a lot of females are not studied in research, right? Until the last few years, it's really bumping up a little bit more. So for you females to say, oh, that research is applicable to me, it might not be. You guys have different hormone fluctuations, especially if you're pre or perimenopause, right? Some things to think about. When we look at, re when you look at research online, like on Facebook or on the websites, on, on news, it says, oh, research states. And you're like, well, that's totally cool. I'm the guy who looks behind that and actually reads the study and say, oh, no, no, that's not cool. Right? That's actually, they're blowing up a conclusion, but they're not actually telling you the guts of the story. I'm keeping you guys kind of long here. Yes. I can see the, the eyelids are getting lower and lower. Yes. Women, well, that, that could be debatable. Women actually you, uh, burn more fat. Burn, women are better at burning fat than men are in a general standpoint. I've seen women that are not good individually, but that's the, the, the generalization. Yeah. Whether or not you need more fat, that's, I would say that's to be determined. Yeah. Depending on the, the life cycle too, right? Yeah. All horn, what, you guys, if you guys don't know this, women are very complex. Right, guys, you guys know this, right? <laughs> but from a hormonal standpoint, extremely complex. That's why, do you guys know, that's why not a lot of researchers will do a lot with females because they have to plan based on the menstrual cycle. And it's very difficult for researchers to do that sometimes. And it's very costly, too. So. Postmenopausal will probably be a lot easier. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to, it's almost 9 o'clock, so I'm going to, Say thank you to Shane and, and Steve and Project Move for, one, having me here, but for you guys showing up on a, on a Wednesday night. That uh, shows a lot of dedication because I can tell a lot of you are getting hungry, aren't you? I know I just tell from your eyes. Well, I, I say a lot, trust me. Yeah. Bedtime. Does anybody, it, it is, yeah, it's probably past some people's bedtime, right? Um, so, so I thank you. If you guys, so my contact info is up here. I have business cards. Um, if by any chance you do want to buy the only book on the market that tells you and teaches you about metabolic efficiency, I have those for sale here. Otherwise, you can find me. I'm very, very easy to get a hold of in terms of email or telephone. Um, I am increasing my FaceTime at Project Move, so if you are a member here, here, you'll be seeing me. I'm in that room that has energy performance all blasted on it, so that's where I'm at right now. But uh, thank you for your time tonight. I'd be more than happy to come back and give another presentation, maybe on, on youth. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Michelle. Oh, I will sell these books. You're usually $21.95, but I'd sell them for an even 20, so I don't have to make any change. 